Welcome to For IG Meets. Uh, my name is Scott, and this is I'm Beth McKinley. Both McKinleys, <laughs> and um, yes, yeah, so, so we've been hosting this for a little while now, uh, since last Maybe May. Yeah, we've yeah. been doing this. So we've had a lot of interesting topics along the way. Uh, all of those, with the exception of one, are recorded. And uh, if you ever want to go back and look at any of the old meets that we've done, they are on the, uh, the web site, which is for our G, for our grandchildren. Um, .ca. And uh, so, yeah, you can go back and we had ones on um, electric vehicles, on retrofitting your home, on getting out into nature, the effects on nature, I'm missing two or three more, but there's lots of interesting topics that you've hit on already. So I want to start with a bit of a land acknowledgement. Um, I think somebody was already mentioned something along that line. So we respect the, respectfully acknowledge that Peterborough County is located on the Treaty 20 uh, Michisagig territory and in the traditional territory of the Michisagig and Chippewa Nation, collectively known as the Williams Treaties First Nations. We conclude Bird Lake, Hiawatha, Alderville, Scugog Island, Rama, Bozole, and um, Georgian Island First Nations. So here at uh, 4RG, we respectfully acknowledge that the Williams Treaties First Nations are the stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters in perpetuity, and that they continue to maintain this responsibility to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. All right, so that's gonna take over a little bit at this point. So um, before uh, we pass things over to Pat, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background about who we are as for our grandchildren. Um, and as Scott likes to say, this isn't an announcement that our children are having children. <laughs> we are not grandparents, but we are, as Scott likes to say, we're all grandchildren. So for our grandchildren, it's for all of us. So I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to for our grandchildren. Um, before we pass things over to Pat. So for those of you who might be new to For Our Grandchildren, we saw a lot of new names coming across the, um, the email sign up that we have established. For RG is a Peterborough-based climate action group, and the mission is to inspire, inform, and mobilize people to take effective action in response to the climate crisis. And our goal really is to empower people to be part of the solution. I think for me, um, a couple of years ago, I started hearing about all the solutions. Um, when I was just listening to mainstream media, I was hearing about all the problems. When I started to hear about more and more of the solutions, um, it really inspired me to become more involved because I was becoming aware of how much was actually happening all around the world. And it really blew my mind. And so here I am. I, Scott and I joined for our grandchildren about a year and a half ago. Um, we have several ways you can follow what we're doing on social media. So we have a Facebook page. We have a Facebook private group that you just asked to join. Um, and we're starting to get with what the younger kids are doing. And we've got an Instagram account up and running and we're starting to figure out how to use that. Also, there's a lot of information on our website um, as well as suggested actions. And this, is, this month's suggested action may have um, gone under the screen. You might not have noticed this. The government announced on December, December 14th uh, that they're opening up a survey for one month to ask you what you're interested um, in them I'm doing. <laughs> that was really well said. They want to know what you want them to do about climate action. So if you go to the For Our Grandchildren uh, website, you'll see there's a few different ways that you can interact. And, let the government know what you're interested in. So we have several committees um, where people can become more active. We have political, a political action committee, a communications, um, event planning, and then we have this 4RG meets, which is our, our monthly meeting. The next 4RG meets, um, they normally um, are scheduled for the second Monday of the month, with February 14th being the second Monday of February, we thought you might be having romantic dinners perhaps, or just eating a whole lot of chocolate, <laughs> one or the other, or combined. So we are shifting that meeting um, to the 7th of February, um, and Cheryl Lyon will be talking to us about um, how living locally and local economies are an effective uh, response to climate change. And then upcoming meetings are going to focus on water with Dorothy Taylor from Curve Lake First Nation, We'll have another one on trees um, 
as kind of an introduction to a tree event that we're doing in Peterborough this spring. Um, and then in May, we'll be having a session on how to garden, gardening in an era of climate change. And uh, so our guest tonight is uh, Pat Learmonth, and she is the former director of Farms at Work, a nonprofit regional project supporting new farmers, food system development, and farmland protection in East Central Ontario. Pat served as environmental farm plan representative and workshop leader for Peterborough County for seven years and co-founded the East Central Farm Stewardship Collaborative. She is past chair of the Peterborough and the Kawartha's Economic Development Agricultural Advisory Committee, co-chair of the Peterborough Alliance for Food and Farming, and chair of the Peterborough Ag Roundtable. She served on the board of Sustain Ontario for many years and is now on the board of Farms at Work. Pat and her husband own a farm near Peterborough. So, busy lady. <laughs> and uh, yes, she has much to share with us and uh, there will be questions. So as those questions arise, um, best thing to do is to write them down in the chat uh, before you forget them. And uh, when we're finished with the presentation itself, there'll be lots of additional time to answer some of those questions, to ask more questions um, and discuss things in general. Thanks, Scott. Well, thank you so much to, for our grandchildren for making the space for this conversation um, today and um, also for opening it up to a diverse um, group of participants. Uh, it's, it's really nice to see that there are some farmers in the audience uh, today. And I'm hoping that this is gonna be just the beginning of the conversation. Uh, there's no way that I can do regenerative agriculture and climate change justice uh, between now and eight o'clock tonight. Uh, so it's going to be a bit of um, an effort at putting together a framework. So I'm just hoping that by the end of it, people are gonna have enough information that they're gonna know what questions to ask and that we're all gonna have a better starting place so that we have some baseline knowledge uh, throughout the people that are on uh, the call tonight. <clears throat> and um, I'm very glad to hear that, we're, that, that people are interested in having a, um, a, a, climate, or a climate science session because this is not going to be a climate science session. And I know that there are people on this call um, I've seen names that uh, I, I can tell you there are people on this call who know way more about various parts of this presentation than I do. And um, I really want to acknowledge that, that I just happen to be the person who's, um, who's making the presentation, but definitely not an expert on the, all the aspects of this very complex uh, topic. So uh, with that, let's dive right into the main question, which is, um, what is regenerative agriculture? And it's interesting to know that th we all think that this is a, a new term, but in fact, Robert Rodale from the Rodale Institute uh, in Pennsylvania was the first one to use this term back in the 1980s. And uh, eventually it kind of fell out of favor by the end of the 80s. But um, what, he felt, what he felt was that sustainability wasn't challenging enough and that we really had to go beyond sustainability. So it, as a matter of semantics, he was proposing that regeneration was a more active term than sustaining was. And if you look at what Holistic Management Canada has to say about regenerative agriculture, um, they are kind of taking that same um, uh, lens as well because they're distinguishing between degenerating where soil is degrading and so on, biodiversity is decreasing and sustaining and then regenerating where you're actually actively restoring. And I, I really don't think that it's fair to, um, to actually suggest that the concepts in, around sustainable agriculture um, over the past you know, decades have not included action, um, you know, um, real action, but I think that that's, that's the lens that, that some people are taking and why they like the term regenerating better than sustaining right now. So it's something to remember for our own definition tonight. And then I went to Regeneration Canada and looked at what they say, and, and they talk about their mission, and they talk about the fact that their mission is um, <coughs> to promote soil regeneration in order to, and they list a whole bunch of great outcomes from, uh, from doing that. And so their focus is very much on soil regeneration, which is a, um, you know, another piece of the puzzle here for us. Canadian organic growers, on the other hand, um, suggest that we consider the whole chain of events um, on the farm from producing 
to produce a crop from fertility inputs all the way through to distribution. So basically a, a sort of a life cycle analysis is what regenerative agriculture is about according to um, the way that they have interpreted it. And so if you're confused, um, that's not surprising. Um, I've certainly been confused. And last week at the Ontario Agricultural Conference, Christoph Wand from OMAFRA said, there is significant confusion about what is in and what is out, re regen, and how different stakeholders use the term. So I think we can start from there. It's very interesting. OMAFRA themselves, the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, are uh, struggling to, um, to get their arms around this idea. And there really is no fixed def definition right now. But the second thing that he said last week was that soil health is the priority. So um, I think that that's uh, something uh, that we should keep in mind. And as a result, I've sort of come up with a working definition of regenerative agriculture for us for tonight. And that is um, regenerative agriculture is an approach to farming that highlights continuous that's a nod to this idea of not being in a steady state, continuous soil improvement as the key to many economic, social, and environmental benefits. And time will tell what, whether regenerative agriculture actually ever gets one fixed definition. Certainly uh, the term, term sustainable agriculture over the decades that it was used never really had any uh, well-defined definition, single definition. So just quickly, I mean, when we talk about the benefits that you can get from um, soil improvement, there are, it, we, we, the list would go on forever. These are some high points. Um, obviously, sequestration of carbon and reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, increased climate resilience, not only on farms, but elsewhere. Um, reduced costs of inputs on farms. Reduction of soil loss through erosion. Cleaner water increased biodiversity and increased nutritional value of crops. And these are all things that are, are on people's websites that, that are mentioned on a regular basis. And I think that what's um, relevant about this is that while a number of these benefits directly relate to climate change, it definitely does highlight for us that the only benefit, the, that all of the benefits of regenerative agriculture, if it's defined as soil improvement, are not about climate. There are benefits here that are economic for farmers, and there are benefits here that are purely environmental. There are benefits that uh, relate to human health and our social benefits. And, um, and so I think that it's just important to realize that these things are not one and the same, that everybody comes to soil improvement with their own lens and the, out, and the, uh, and the benefits have, um, have implications well beyond climate change. On the other hand, I think that climate change uh, conversations have been um, a part of the uh, reason that there's such a spotlight and such a high level of interest in this term regenerative agriculture, because as was already mentioned in the conversation before we started tonight, over the past few years, it's been incredible, along with the increasing amount of conversation and information about climate change. There have been so many films and books that have come out. There's been so much attention from the press and it's really great because it has brought the community into the conversation with the farming community about soil health. And soil health, to be very clear, is not a new topic to the agricultural community. Um, the Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association was formed in 1939, and that should tell you something right there. <laughs> Back in the 30s and 40s and 50s, there was a lot of talk about the need for soil improvement. And I'm just going to throw out, uh, speaking of books, one that might be very interesting for people to read. Um, it's called Gold in the Grass, and it's written by Margaret Leatherbarrel. And she and her husband in the early 50s bought a farm near Guelph that was completely run out. There was no, the soil was, uh, had no fertility. They couldn't grow anything there. And over the coming years, they um, did amazing things on that farm and it became a showpiece and people came from far and wide, well beyond Ontario to see what they were doing on their farm. And it was all about improving the soil. And so, you know, over the, the last 80 years, there, there have been all kinds of words that have been used within agriculture to talk about the, that have highlighted soil. 
um, and the need for soil improvement. Each of these terms that are on the screen right now, you know, I, I don't want to um, minimize their significance individually because they all have um, different um, connotations and, and they're, they're not all the same. But I would say that the common thread that has been um, constant throughout the past 80 years has been the understanding that the key to um, success is paying attention to the soil and, and, and doing soil improvement. And the term regenerative is really um, a more recent addition to this very um, long list of, of words. So um, there is a lot of confusion. There are a lot of um, nuances, but I think we just need to kind of push our way through it and say, let's just focus on soil improvement because that is the baseline. And because um, soil improvement has been such an important conversation in the farm community um, over this period of time, it, it has attracted um, attention from federal and provincial governments who have provided cost share funding to support farmers to do soil improvement projects and other um, environmental projects on their farms. Uh, we happen to have a study that I did a couple of years ago uh, just for Peterborough County to try and just, you know, get it out there that there has been a significant investment even between 2005 and 2018. Um, I uh, figure that probably there's been about $2.4 million invested by funders and the farmers themselves in cost shared environmental improvement projects in our county. And that's just that only reflects the farmers that actually applied for funding assistance to go ahead and do their projects. And lots and lots of farmers are doing these things on their farms and they're not asking for any support. So the, the numbers go well beyond this and they go back in time before 2005, but at least it gives you an idea that there really is some serious activity going on out there and that this is not something that we need to preach to the farmers about because they've already heard all of this and they do know an awful lot about it. <clears throat> you can read that report, which is only about five or six pages long. If you go to Farms That Works um, library, our library, or if you go to Local Food Peterborough, I don't think any other counties in the province have done a report like this, but if, you, if they were to do it, I mean, this is not unique to Peterborough County. So regenerative agriculture and climate. So, if regenerative agriculture, as we have um, decided, <laughs> relates to and focuses on soil health, how does soil health relate to climate change? So that's the next big question for us to answer. And this is where we get into the science-y kind of part of this presentation. But I also want to remind you that this is not, this is not a science uh, lesson. Um, there's no way that we can talk about soil health in the next three minutes in any meaningful way but I'm going to try and at least make some connections so that you'll have an idea as to, um, as to how these um, concepts do connect with each other. So to start with, we have to get an idea about uh, what soils uh, look like. And there are kind of two fundamental things to know, and that is that there's a concept about soil quality or capacity, um, which is something that you really can't do a whole lot to change. And we'll talk about that in a second. And then there's the concept of soil health, which is the condition of the soil. So soil quality is the capacity of soils. Soil health is the condition of the soil at any given time. And that can be measured through various sort of practical in-field or laboratory-based testing. And it is something that can be changed over time. So what we're doing when we're improving soil is basically focusing on the soil health rather than the soil quality. Soil quality is something that you can, you know, start to understand by reading a soil map. And for those of you who may never have seen a soil map, this is just a portion of Peterborough's soil map. And you can see that there are a whole lot of different soils in quite a small area. On our farm, I think we have at least three. On other farms, they, they could have more than that, certainly. And by, by looking at a soil map and by doing some um, research, you can find out a fair amount about what the capacity of that soil might be, including um, the kind of erosion risks that it um, might carry with it, depending on how much, how sandy it is, for example, versus how much clay it's got in it. So every soil is unique in terms of the percentage of sand 
clay and silt, silt that it contains, and that dictates a lot about the um, capacity of the soil. But when it comes to the health of the soil, it's a different conversation. So this is straight from Omafra, and what you can see here is that um, that soil capacity, that mineral part of the soil, if you want to put it that way, is this gray area. It's, you know, 45% of the soil. Whereas the rest of it, the other 55% of the soil is um, either organic matter or air and water in a healthy soil. So this is what you're aiming for. And if you don't have the air and the water and the organic matter, then you know, that's when you've got a desertified soil. And literally, you know, they call it a desertified soil because it looks like a desert. It can look like a desert. And I took it out because of time constraints, but I actually had a photograph here of what it looked like near Orno in the 1930s when um, the soil there literally just turned into blow sand. And since then, the Ganaraska forest has been planted on top of it very successfully. So the key to building soil, um, getting that air in there, that water in there, the space for those things is soil organic matter. And, and soil organic matter is really the key to this entire discussion about soil improvement. It's the engine behind soil building. And it can do things like holding 80 to 90% of its own weight in water. It contains many plant essential nutrients and it is where all the organisms are. And this quote is kind of nice. One small handful of healthy surface soil contains more organisms than the whole population of humans on earth. So um, that's always an interesting thing to imagine when you pick up a handful of soil in your garden, healthy, healthy soil that is. And just to put a little bit more of a spin on um, soil organic matter and and trying to imagine how we can support soil organic matter if we're going to build soil. On the right hand side of this um, slide, you can see that there's a whole block there that's called easily decomposable organic matter. And this is where all the living organisms are and where readily de de decomposable organic matter is, which includes, and you, hopefully you can read it, it says crop residue and roots and dead organisms. And so this gives us a pretty big clue that if you've got crop residue and you've got roots, that you're going to be feeding the organisms that are going to be sequestering the carbon. And then if you move to the right hand side of the um, slide, you know, that's how you manage to get moderately decomposable organic matter that's been worked on by um, the soil organisms and the very stable organic um, matter or humus that uh, can be up to a thousand years old. Now, I hope I haven't said anything that um, Karen Thompson, who's on this call, is going to take great exception to because she is the soil expert. But generally speaking, I just wanted you to have a little bit of an idea of how to possibly make the connections between climate and carbon and um, soil matter and, uh, and uh, soil improvement. And so this is, this is kind of where it all happens is right here in this easily decomposable organic matter where you're getting carbon and you're getting it into the soil and then the organisms are able to act on it and sequester carbon as well as doing all kinds of other things. So if we're trying to build healthy soil, then clearly there are a few things that we're gonna be trying to do. We're gonna be trying to increase that carbon available to build the soil organic matter. We're going to be trying to keep those organisms healthy. We're gonna be trying to create and protect space for air and water in the soil and obviously, intuitively, we're going to try to do things that are going to prevent the erosion of soil and, and we don't want to be simply losing it right off of the fields. So I'm hoping that, that um, that's about as deep as we're going to get into the science, but if you can keep some of these ideas in your mind as we go forward, then it'll help you to um, just follow some of the simple things that uh, we're going to talk about um, in terms of actions. So how are we doing in our area of the world in terms of changes to soil organic carbon over the past 30 years? So what are, you know, what are things looking like? The bad news is that in Western Canada, they have been increasing soil organic carbon over this period, but in Eastern, including Central Ontario, that is not the case. 
So you can see Peterborough there, I hope, on the map. Um, and we have got some red, we've got some yellow, we've got some orange, and we have been losing soil organic carbon uh, now, which is a good, uh, soil organic, organic carbon is not exactly the same as soil organic matter, but it makes up 58% uh, of soil organic matter. So it's a good proxy for um, soil organic matter. And, and things have not been going in the right direction in our area of the world. The reason that um, is given in the research that that uh, map came from, from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada is that between 1981 and 2011, Eastern Canada has experienced a gradual shift away from perennial crops, such as pasture and forage, towards annual crops, such as cereal and oil seeds. And annual crops tend to contribute very little to soil carbon. And so this is what has resulted in these um, decreases over time. And um, that's a pretty fundamental statement. And certainly um, Peterborough historically has been a place where pasture has been the primary activity. And um, so it, it is important for us to know that shifting uh, towards annual crops um, is not going to get us where we wanna go in the future and that we need to think about how we're going to manage this. You can see from these uh, three photographs on this, on this uh, slide that um, if you've got in the center continuous corn, which is an annual crop, then in this, if this was a long-term trial that um, was reported by OMAFRA in one of their best management practices series, uh, long-term trial at the end of it, 3.8% organic matter in the soil. Permanent sod on the right-hand side, so basically the pasture, 7.1% um, organic matter. Huge difference over the same time period with the same soil. And then on the far left-hand side, you've got a woodlot where you've got 21% organic matter in there. Obviously, way more carbon being sequestered in that woodlot than in either one of the farming systems. So, um, what is it as a practical matter, if we've been losing soil organic matter over the past 30 years, what, what as a practical matter um, can we do about, about this? Um, what kinds of activities can we undertake? So it was timely that last week, um, the, um, the OMAFRA actually made a presentation on this topic um, at the um, Ontario Agricultural Conference. And uh, I have spoken to the presenter and he allowed me to just simply use one of his slides here. And um, they, they identified four principles of regenerative agriculture. And I'm going to simply adopt those for simplicity. We're gonna walk through those four principles and just as at a very high level see what do they have to do with this conversation that we just had about building healthy soils. So the first one is minimizing tillage. And tillage is, it, it's plowing, it's, it's, it's disturbing the soil, it's going in there and using uh, some form of equipment that um, disturbs the surface of the soil. And, and it's very useful for a number of purposes. On the other hand, it has a tendency to result in loss of carbon every time it happens. It also has a tendency because of the heavy equipment involved to compact the soil, which means that that space that we need for water and for air, you know, is, is, not, um, is not supported by, by compaction. It, it's squeezing down the soil and um, it's not supporting good soil structure. And the, it, but if you, um, if you minimize tillage, you're also going to be protecting, um, you're gonna avoid compaction, you're gonna reduce those carbon losses, but you're also gonna be protecting soil organ, organisms from disturbance. Uh, so every time you go through and, and plow a field or use tillage, then the organisms are, are going to be impacted, and especially fungi who um, take longer to recover from disturbance than uh, some of the other um, organisms in question. The second uh, principle that they outlined, uh, they used a lot of very different words, but to... Uh, to say it simply, it's keeping bare soil covered. So if you've got a field and you're growing crop, then what parts of that field are bare? 
while the crop is in the field? What parts of that, uh, to what extent is that field empty after you've harvested? What, to what extent is that field bare over the winter and so on? And the idea here is that you want to look for those bare areas and to make sure that the, to the greatest extent possible, you've got, you're planting something that covers that soil um, throughout the year and, uh, and spatially throughout the field. And what this does is it um, offers the maximum opportunity for plant roots to be in that soil. And we saw that plant roots, when they die, become a source of carbon. And also if you have a cover crop, and sometimes cover crops are actually plowed into the soil. And so that adds um, organic matter as well, uh, carbon into the soil for those um, soil organi organisms to act on. The, shaded, the, the fact that you've got a cover crop also shades the soil, which helps it to retain moisture which we know we need. It also suppresses weeds and as a result can reduce um, the need for uh, herbicide um, application. And finally, covered soil is less likely to be eroded by either wind or water. Just physically, you can imagine why that would be the case. Just recently, in the last couple of months, um, the uh, results of the um, 2020 Ontario cover crop survey were released and there was a webinar about that um, and the outcome the outcomes were interesting they had 520 respondents and these are farmers obviously that grew cover crops in 2020 and 91 percent of them um, observed benefits to them from growing the cover crops um, improved soil health less soil erosion and increased soil organic matter um, and uh, they reported those benefits within three years of adopting cover crops. So I think more and more information, practical information is coming out about this and it's, it's excellent for farmers to be able to hear what their um, colleagues are saying about uh, um, their results. The third um, thing that WOMAFRA identified is increasing plant diversity and there are a couple of different uh, ways that we can talk about that. And the first one is plant diversity in terms of crops. So that means rather than just planting the same thing year after year or planting the same two things in rotation, you know, one after the other, to try to get more complexity into that rotation where you're using more different um, species of crops um, with all different characteristics, um, one after the other, and also uh, and including um, getting perennial um, uh, uh, perennial plants into the rotation. And what the, the benefits that this has is that it breaks uh, the disease and pest cycles, so it reduces the need for pesticides. And, and I, that's got to be a positive thing when you think about the organisms um, in the soil that you're trying to, to protect. And there has been some research done in Peterborough here, certainly about ground nesting um, bees and what the impact has been on them of pesticides that were applied to a crop in which they were nesting. And um, I won't go into the details of that. That would be another interesting um, presentation for, for our grandchildren to have would be a presentation by the researcher who did that work here. Um, and secondly, for example, if as one of your uh, part of your plant, um, your, your um, rotation, you include legumes, which are peas and beans, basically, they actually can take nitrogen and fix it in the soil and reduce the need for um, added nitrogen fertilizer, which has a benefit, of course, for the farmers um, in terms of input costs. But the other thing that I also want to mention around increasing plant diversity is um, that uh, we can't ignore the fact that if one were to plant um, things that are not crops, um, but that are in fact perennials that include trees and shrubs and so on on the farm where appropriate, then clearly those things are also going to have a positive impact on uh, soil health um, as, as well as a, a raft of other benefits. And um, so for example, wind breaks um, that reduce erosion um, stream buff buffers that keep water clean and um, renaturalizing unproductive areas, most of which has already been done because we've had 200 years to figure out what, what parts of the farms are, are worth farming and what parts aren't worth farming. 
and so on. So it's just important to, to think maybe a little bit beyond crops and just realize that sometimes um, you can actually plant these permanent per perennial plantings that they'll have multi multiple benefits as well on the farm if they're appropriate in that uh, context. Just uh, one inter very interesting um, uh, note when we're talking about something like a uh, woodlot on a farm. There was a study that was done in 2016 by a Trent University student using the HOLOS um, methodology, which is developed by Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. And this was done on Dorisdale Farm. Um, Pete Doris is uh, an OMAFRA employee and he has a beef and crops farm. And it was a snapshot of one year, but the, uh, the results of that study showed that the emissions from the um, activities on the farm, uh, the farming activities was 51 metric tons of CO2 equivalent. So there might've been emissions like methane from cows that were factored in here, but it's all, it's all um, rejigged to show it as the equivalent of CO2. And, but on his farm, there was 790 metric tons of CO2 equivalent sequestered in that same year. So the, the net is 739 metric tons sequestered. And, and the reason for that is that he has a woodlot. And it, it's just interesting to know that because in Peterborough County, the vast majority of farms have woodlots or wetlands on them. And it has to do with just the topography. You know, we have drumlins, we have um, shallow soils in the north half of the county. <clears throat> and just about everybody is going to have a natural area on their farm that would actually affect the net um, on an annual basis on their farm. However, um, this is absolutely not to say that improvements can't be made. And um, there's still that 51 metric tons there. And I'm sure that Pete would say that he's well aware that there are improvements that could be made on his farm where he could get those emissions down on an annual basis. So the last thing is this idea of integrating livestock. And um, this, is, this is fascinating because over the last um, you know, 75, 80 years, there, agriculture has definitely gone in the direction of farms doing this or the farm does that or the farm does this. And not so much that, that people are doing both livestock and crops. And so the suggestion that's being made here is that the introduction of perennial grass into rotation with annual crops is really critical and integrating the livestock along with that grass is also critical. <clears throat> Obviously perennial plants are not tilled and they, everything about a perennial um, pasture is positive from a carbon point of view. And if you have got cows in there, then they're dropping the manure and, and uh, urine and all the nutrients that are coming from that directly um, onto the soil with sort of no intermediate process that's involved uh, that uh, goes along with that. So there are all kinds of benefits to this idea of integrating livestock. And of course, we can't leave that topic without addressing the fact that there has been an awful lot of talk in the last number of years about cows being the um, cows being the problem, that methane is the problem, that um, we have to get away from that. And instead people are eating burgers that are made from annual crops. And based on what we've just read and heard about annual crops versus pasture, you know, it's important to understand that, that it's not as simple as saying that cows are the problem. It can be more of a management issue. And the, um, the quote here from this particular study from the Journal of Soil and Water kind of says it all. It says, with appropriate grazing management, ruminant livestock can increase carbon sequestered in the soil to more than offset their own greenhouse gas emissions in the form of, of methane. So just something that you can keep in mind, because I was pretty sure somebody was going to ask about that. Beyond, if, we, if we're going to define regenerative agriculture in terms of, so, of continuous soil improvement alone, then I want to just note that we're going to be missing some of the connections between climate and farms that don't have to do with soil improvement. So I just wanted to throw in these ideas just so that you could see that on farms, um, people are doing very interesting things like doing solar cattle watering systems out in fields. Um, 
in the right on the right hand side of the slide, you've got a, sol a solar hot water system on the roof of a barn and it heats the water for the wash water in this dairy barn. Um, people are also doing, you know, they can do projects like improving insulation where they've got heated farm buildings. And I'm sure that over time, you know, there are going to be all kinds of developments in terms of vehicle conversions on the farm, um, implement conversions, and there are already interesting robotic things that are happening where it, where we can send out small pieces of machinery instead of big tractors to do some, some act of the activities in the field, and there will be positive benefits um, around that. As a matter of interest, actually, we insulated the shop on our farm and um, we used cellulose insulation rather than um, uh, the pink stuff. And uh, we did that because in using the cellulose, you are actually embedding carbon into your building. And um, that was a really interesting exercise. And since then, we've also done that in another building. And right now, builders are a little bit leery about it, but I think that people need to start demanding cellulose insulation whenever possible. And the last thing I want to touch on just before um, I finish is that we can't really talk about climate and um, farming without at least mentioning local food. In our climate change action plans in Peterborough County and all the townships have them, um, we talk about uh, not only activities on farms like the ones in the rest of this presentation, but also the local food system and the importance of supporting localization of the food system. And while I'm not going to talk about that, it just we don't want to lose that idea. And I would welcome everyone to visit localfoodptbo.ca or if you haven't already, follow, um, follow Local Food Peterborough on social media at Local Food PTBO on Instagram, uh, Facebook and um, Twitter. And so um, with that, I think the big question going forward is how do we continue this conversation? And in the Peterborough context, um, you know, how do we put our climate change action plans into, um, we have the plans, how do we actually put them into action? And how do we actually support the farmers um, uh, to the extent needed in order that they can participate in carrying out those climate action plans as well? And so, with that, um, I'd like to thank you very much for listening to this. I hope it has been helpful to you and, um, and uh, may provide the foundation for some continuing conversation. Well, thank you, Pat, so much. There, that was a lot of information. Um, first of all, just thank you for clarifying what regenerative agriculture is. And um, I think it really helps us <laughs> if we, if we are using a term and we all are meaning the same thing, you know, um, there's so many meanings that people bring to that word. So when we're talking about regenerative agriculture, are we actually talking about the same thing? And also for mentioning, um, it's not just environmental environmental benefits that it has, but also economic and social. Um, it's positive. I was happy to hear that there's some funding assistance for the farmers. Um, Obviously, they've been concerned about this for a long time. I mean, these are folks who live on the land and are seeing the soil health firsthand and knowing what's happening. Um, so it's nice to see there's funding assistance and also that you mentioned that the farmers are seeing some benefits. I'm not going to forget your description of healthy soil. Uh, one handful <laughs> of healthy soil contains as many organisms as there are humans on the earth. Um, that's, that's really powerful. And, and your point about um, you know, burgers and cows versus burgers made from prepared annual crops. There's going to be a conversation in my family about that. <laughs> we are often having that discussion about veganism, vegetarianism. Are we eating meat? I was talking to a woman um, in the last month who she may actually present for us in the future. Um, she's looking at uh, how we eat and its relation to climate change. And she was saying that there's research showing eating a little bit of beef every every week is actually good for our mental health. So it's just always none of this stuff is straightforward. There's so much that we're learning. And you were you managed to take a broad and very complex topic and present it to us um, in a really clear way. Um, 
so that we have a better understanding of what needs to be done to improve soil health um, and some of the big approaches that are uh, being used. Also, I think your final point, um, you know, what can we do to promote those community, um, sorry, those climate change action plans and what can we do to um, help the farmers is super important. So thank you so much for all the time you put into this presentation. Um, I feel like it's the tip of the iceberg, but at least I have a sense of what I'm talking about now. Um, we have some questions in the chat, um, so I'll let you take it over, Scott. I I'll just back up to some comments, some questions, and Entangled, Entangled World, World is a, just these are comments. Entangled World is a, a book on soil, fungi, and algae. Um, we have a question. To what extent does reduced tillage require the use of Roundup to get rid of the weeds um, just before the drill planting? And uh, how do you get around this problem? That's a great question because I had the same one written down. <laughs> Right. Well, I mean, this d d totally depends on the farming system. And certainly uh, one of the downsides of no-till has been that it has increased the use of, of Roundup. There's no question about it. Um, so uh, th there, th the whole question of tillage has a lot of, there's a lot of benefits, there's a lot of disadvantages. And I think that you have to look at the specific farming system to be able to come up with the right formula for for that particular farm uh, where you can balance the benefits against the downsides. Certainly if you were talking about organic agriculture where you can't use those things, they simply have to find a different way to do things. So I know that that's not a, a perfect answer, but there is no perfect answer to that question. Um, if, you're, if you're going to um, do no-till, and you can't drill into what is there and uh, that's that's living, or that, or if it's if you have to kill it off, and then that that's what you're doing. That's what people are doing, and there needs to be um, a different system put in place to get away from it. Um, Stuart writes, uh, "I have seen it written that in regenerative regenerative agricultural, the soil is the crop." Um, and the, the crop itself is the byproduct. the byproduct. Yeah. So that's kind of an interesting way of looking at it. And I think this question here is this a standard that is too high? Oh, there you go. Well, I was just going to say to Scott's point that, you know, you also have um, livestock farmers who will say that the grass is the product and not the livestock. <laughs> I guess it's a philosophy more than anything else. Shout out to um, the biggest little farm. Um, you can watch the trailer and interviews on YouTube. Drew Monkman asks, I love this question, um, and Scott does too as a bird watcher. <laughs> Why are we seeing so much removal of hedgerows and even the edges of woodlots on local farms, especially south of Peterborough? I can, I, I can extend that. We went down to Billy there a few years ago, and there was these of course, big flat fields, and they were already huge. And while we were there, we could see them taking up more fence rows and piling them up and burning them, and uh, in just endless swaths of open, uncovered soil. And it was quite literally, it was horrifying <laughs> for me. Anyway, well, the the simple the simple answer is that the machinery is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and it only makes sense for people who are driving great huge pieces of machinery to find the most economic and quick way to get around a field. And um, they look at those hedgerows as an impediment and, um, and the hedgerows are also taking up field space. And so there's an economic cost to having that hedgerow sit there because if it takes up, you know, a half an acre in total, then that's a half an acre where they could be planting instead. So that is the simple answer as to why it's happening. But I suppose if, from what you were saying there earlier is that if those hedgerows are getting other benefits that in the long run might might actually be better in the long run. <laughs> There's definitely an argument to be made <laughs> for sure. Yeah. I'm just going to um, pause for a moment. 
Um, usually at eight o'clock, we just stop to um, point out that it is eight o'clock. And if you had plans to head on and do something, you know, feel free to um, leave the meeting. And we look forward to you coming back on another meeting next month or down the road. Um, thank you for coming tonight. And then we will continue with more of the questions. But uh, Stuart Butts has another great question here. He talks about farmers being cities, but the cities are what consumes the massive amounts of nutrients that end up in the sewage treatment plant, the other um, wastes, I think that means, including uh, pharmaceuticals. The output from sewage treatment plants is not very recyclable in North America, or at least in North America. In Asia, night soil is an important contributor to soil fertility. Is this a deep flaw in the Western civilization way of treating wastewater? Oh, thanks so much, Stu, for that. <laughs> I don't think I want to answer whether it's a flaw or not, but um, <laughs> I, <laughs> but I, I mean, it is it is a huge problem, especially with the amount of pharmaceuticals at this point that are, that are um, being flushed down toilets one way or another. Um, you know, the, the, this is a recent development where just about everybody is taking something and it all ends up in the same place and it's unknown what the life is of those um, pharmaceuticals in soil. I don't know how much research has been done on it. Maybe someone else does, but, uh, but yeah, it, it, it seems to me that it would be of concern. It certainly has been shown to be a concern when those pharmaceuticals end up in waterways and the impact that they have on um, the um, fish and other life in, in streams and in the lakes. So the concern. It certainly would make sense if we could get that stuff, those nutrients back into the soils from which they came. Well, it, it, and yes, uh, and it's another, uh, it's another argument potentially in terms of increasing localization and where you can get more of a control over things because when you talk about a place the size of Toronto, I don't know what you'd ever do to try and um, manage it. Maybe, in, maybe if the nutrients aren't going as far, and we can have a more local conversation, then maybe there'll be solutions that we can come up with over time. We all need to go back to outhouses, maybe. Is that, maybe that's what I, think, I think that's what Stu's actually suggesting. Can, can they be heated? <laughs> Not just the big apartment buildings, everyone trapes them down and out the door. Okay, Cheryl asks, how does reduction of fossil fuel energy use in farming figure into regenerative agriculture? Yeah, so my answer to that, Cheryl, is that it has everything to do with the definition of regenerative ag agriculture. And what I was trying to say this evening is that if we talk about regenerative agriculture as being related to soil improvement, then it, it, those things are not necessarily going to be connected. And there could be some advantages to having a narrow definition of regenerative agriculture just so that we can get our arms around that. But it doesn't change the fact that reduction of fossil fuel use on farms is is as just as important as it is in people's households in the city or you know wherever, and so that's why I was showing um, some examples of people generating uh, renewable energy on their farms, and um, and also just hoping that eventually we'll get to uh, being able to use uh, renewable energy for farm uh, equipment as well. Hope that uh, Kat, answers. A slight, uh, a slight footnote to that. Uh, is there any movement towards returning to using horses? To, I don't think it's a question of returning to horses. There are lots of people who have never left horses. Yeah, um, that's true. I can name you some people in the region that are still farming with horses for certain purposes. I absolutely have not heard of a return to using horses. I, yeah. Or, or <laughs> still tractors. Or, or what? Sorry, Cheryl? Tractors. I, I'm still not uh, actually understanding what you're saying. Uh, I was just thinking about solar. Oh, <laughs> oh. well, we, but there is a solar tractor in the region as well. Yeah. Um, absolutely. And uh, so none of these things are out of the question, certainly. The technology around the equipment, I think, is, is up for grabs. And I mean, we've managed to get from cars now up to trucks <laughs> in terms of electric vehicles. And so uh, I'm sure that we'll we'll get to farm equipment as well one of these days. Thank you. So Sandy's making a suggestion, I think, well, <laughs> but, uh, she's mentioned she's a gluten-free vegan and she would like to be interested in a discussion about plant-based diets. And uh, so I think Beth 
you just mentioned that we have someone maybe lined up for food. I will t we'll, we'll look into that, Sandy. And if you know somebody who uh, would like to be a speaker for us, we're always open to suggestions of um, people who can come and speak at the different monthly meetings. Barb mentions that uh, agreeing with Drew that uh, about the hedge hedgerows, um, and then she just put up a conservation easement on her uh, 200 acre farm that prohibit removal of the hedgerows and stone circles. So that's mm -hmm. kind of cool. Laura asks, what practical things can citizens do to support the farmers? Awesome question. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind, of course, that's somewhat tangential, but is the local food system. Certainly, if, to the extent that people are able, if they can participate in the local food system, that's going to support farmers, and it's also going to have implications for climate. But that doesn't that does not support all farmers by any means. Um, beyond that, I think participating in this conversation and in the conversation around our climate change action plans and seeing how we can um, we can put them put some policy in place potentially and lending support to that, uh, I would think would be a, a good answer um, to that question. Just participate in the conversation and uh, because I think that we're going to have to uh, we're going to have to have some serious conversations about how to move forward with some of those uh, proposed actions. I think, I think with some people, because I have met some people that are just like very, like, oh, farmers are doing everything wrong. Well, they're not. And and secondly, even, even if you've got farmers that aren't necessarily trying new things, they're just folks out there trying to make a living too. So you, it, it's important to work with people as opposed to, as opposed to kind of beat them over the head. <laughs> That, that, that's true, that, and that's a good point. I mean, absolutely. Um, we, I think that that's kind of the, the point of the conversation is that if we can get on the same page and just understand everybody's perspective, I think it's going to make for a much more fruitful conversation. Absolutely. And absolutely, the farmer should not be villainized in any of these conversations. Well, and as we were preparing for this with you, Pat, um, a couple of things that I wanted to raise. Uh, one is, you know, what is our farmers at the table when these decisions are being made and the second point that i remember you mentioning was um oh just lost it <laughs> <laughs> our farmers at the table oh, wait, wait. Where, what's the next step after this you know we've got together a group of people um this evening we had upwards of 70 people join in um and so how do we move forward you were concerned about that I am concerned about it because those climate change action plans are sitting there and one of these days we're going to have to um, to move forward with some conversations with the various townships that have adopted them and with the general public and it is absolutely critical that the farmers are at the table. I think that the majority of the farming population right now in Peterborough County would tell you that they don't even know that we have climate change action plans. And if they do know that we've got them, they don't know that they have things in there about agriculture. So we have to make sure that this conversation is inclusive and that people aren't talking about farmers and instead they're talking with farmers. Uh, Donna says, thank you so much. Very informative and interesting topic, much appreciated. And then Gunther, are there any government incentives for farmers to practice regenerative, regenerative, I have a trouble with that word, regenerative agriculture? So, I mean, that's an interesting question because there have been incentives, as I've mentioned, over a long period of time, and, and some of them have certainly been related to soil improvement. There have been any number of them that have. Recently, the availability of funding has um, been going down. We've lost some programs, especially from the provincial government. In other parts of the province, um, even locally here in East Central Ontario, there are funding pots available um, that are available from, for example, the conservation authorities or <clears throat> townships are making money available in some cases. Dufferin County just announced a, a program that specifically had the word regenerative agriculture on it just in the last couple of weeks where they're actually offering funding to farmers who want to try things that they haven't tried before and there's risk attached. And so they're offering them small amounts of money to be able to mitigate those financial risks to go out and try those things. And they, but they specifically say related to regenerative agriculture. So I thought that was an interesting 
development. I had a related question to that. And um, that people, I was talking to a farmer actually just a couple of days ago, and they were saying it would be nice to have somebody that can just come visit your farm and say, this is what you could do. That's some place that's, you know, you could work on. This might be a benefit of doing that without having to invest any money, without having to, you know, leap in and, and ask for big grants for for um, infrastructure or whatnot. And so is there, a, is there a service anywhere where people can go to a farm and visit them and say, this is a possibility? Um, you know, that's another one of these really interesting questions, because if you were to go back, you know, 30 years, the minister used to have, well, there was a full-time employee here in Peterborough. Um, we lost that OMAFRA office years and years ago, but OMAFRA used to provide much, much more manpower for support at the local level than they do now. So um, that's unfortunate because th those, those government folks would have been the kinds of people that would have been able to give some practical advice and they didn't really have a stake in the outcome. Whereas if you've got companies that are selling things going up the driveway and giving advice, then it, it tends to be a little bit self-serving. Um, the more specific answer right now is no. Um, actually, I'm going to take that back. It depends on what part of the province you're in. In our part of the province, we do not have a program that would do that. On the other hand, farmers do have the ability to reach out to certified crop advisors, for example, and to get those people to come and give them specific advice. Um, yeah, so it would be it would be nice to be able to have more supports like that in place. Obviously, it's expensive to get people to go out and do those things. And every farming system is different and every farm is different and every, you know, so it, it's not just one person that you're going to find that's going to be the genius on all of these things. Right. Mm -hmm. right. We still have a few more comments. I'll try to summarize them. A few uh, shout outs to the movie Kiss the Ground. Um, many people saying thank you for a great presentation, an excellent presentation, an informative presentation, an interesting presentation. Um, in the Kiss the Ground movie, we saw the use of a different type of tilling plow that went much shallower and put soil onto uh, the seeds. I'm a city gal. This may be a totally ridiculous way to describe what I saw, but it did suggest that there are newer types of plows that do less damage to the soil. Thanks for the presentation, Pat, and to 4RG for hosting. John Deere has just announced a self-driving tractor that farmers can drive remotely. Don't know if it's solar powered. More thank you for detailed information. You have impressed people, Pat. <laughs> um, he says, you have mentioned the climate change action plan several times. For our grandchildren is trying to get the Peterborough townships to move from the plan to the action. How can townships make the improvements you describe? Well, I think that um, we're going to have to look at what kinds of um, what kinds of things are things that farmers can see that there's enough economic value in, or be convinced that there's enough economic value in that they become willing to go forward and do things on their own. And beyond that, the question is, how are we gonna provide them with support, um, financial support to give those things a shot and see how they go. So I'm off the top of my head, I, I don't know what other um, things to suggest, but I think that that's why we need to sit down at the table and just hammer that out a little bit and, and uh, see, what, see what ideas people have got. I'm not the only person out here. We'll be calling you. Pat, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll be bringing along some people who are much more knowledgeable than I am. You know, we've been we've been trying to figure it out because we don't know anything about this kind of thing. We see it there on the climate change action plan, and we see that when we talk to people like Hillary, who's on, Hillary Bradshaw, who's on this call, we don't know what we can do to try to get the townships to take action to make some of that more feasible. So. And I'm sure right now the townships don't know either, to be exactly. fair. So, yeah, we've got a process to go through. There's a comment here, a uh, tidbit um, conversation with two farmers ready to chip fresh growth hedgerows. So I guess kind of the excess is a 
and it comes out, they cut it back and they put the green material, they chip it and put it on the field, the right effect in terms of restoring carbon to the soil, rather than just burning it or uh, throwing it back into the bush. Right. For sure. And can I make a comment just back on that solar tractor, um, the, or the, the self-driving tractor rather? You know, I just wanted to point out that a self-driving tractor is great if, if, to the extent that it's going to save time for the farmer, which is lovely. Um, to the extent that it's, it, it's still a tractor, it's not going to change the fact that those passes, every pass across the field with that heavy equipment, you know, does some damage and you want to minimize uh, the, the passes on the tractor in terms of compacting the soil. Right. Um... Deanna Leahy says, uh, in addition to the local food um, Peterborough website, she lists another website here to find uh, um, a listing of farms um, around that Peter provide food. Yeah, that's the Peterborough Peter Farm Fresh. Peterborough Farm Fresh. Yeah. 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 I love the Omafra AgriCrew Students Program from the 1980s to the 1990s. Another compliment for you, Pat. <laughs> Great presentation. And Mary Conrad, I feel like you might know her. <laughs> <laughs> Did she say something? Oh, here we go. <laughs> she, she said, you rock and roll, Mom. You're a rock star. I'm so <laughs> proud of you. <laughs> she said, on the topic of getting government advice on regenerative practices for your farm, I think the environmental farm and program would offer advice regarding improvement that could include regenerative practices, correct? Oh, she's all over it. Um, of course, that is absolutely <laughs> true. And I, I don't think I even mentioned the environmental farm plan throughout the entire presentation. But in your, um, in your introduction, Scott, you mentioned that I, I worked uh, for Soil and Crop for seven years and I, I ran the workshops for the environmental farm plan in our county. And yes, those workshops have been available now for 30 years in Peterborough, and they are a source, a free source of huge amounts of information for farmers. And hundreds and hundreds of farmers in Peterborough have taken advantage of that program. You know, some of them once, twice, three times um, as the additions of the plan change. And, and, and um, participation in the environmental farm plan and the creation of an environmental farm plan for your farm as a result of the workshop is often um, a prerequisite for getting uh, some of the funding that's available. So you have to show that you've gone through the process, you've educated yourself, you've identified an action that should be taken, and now you're applying for funding to do that action. Maybe Thanks, that's, Mary Elizabeth. Maybe that's a place where we, when we're talking to our uh, local municipal reps that on a communication scale is getting some of that information out. Uh, regard, you know, they wouldn't be running the program, obviously, but just the communication aspect of it. Monkman right. uh, ask a question. Is there a concern among farmers that the local climate is changing, uh, especially given recent drought and generally warmer winters and hotter summers? So are, are the farmers saying, are, are they noticing change and contributing to climate change? Well, I'm sure that they're that's a kind of a some some are uh, some aren't and um but uh hey david crowley are you listening can you unmute maybe you want to answer that question are you there david hi pat yes i am what was the question <laughs> again the question is is there concern among farmers that the local climate is changing given recent droughts and generally warmer winters and hotter summers yeah, absolutely. It's getting, um, everything's getting more violent. Um, violent winds, violent um, rains, more erosion, um, more ice. Um, I think that's a, a large concern. Um, weather events, um, flooding. Um, it's a huge concern for the agriculture community and uh, there's been a lot of um, push, as you mentioned before, for cover crops to keep the soil covered up um, for erosion purposes. But yeah, no, it, um, it's a huge problem. And even, but we have seen um, also uh, the growing seasons getting longer. Um, you know, they're growing corn in the Liskard now. Um, 20 years ago, that was unheard of. They're growing soybeans in Manitoba. That was unheard of. There's a huge change. 
having said that though, Pat, um, the genetics, the plant breeding, the tillage equipment, the planters, everything, so it's unbelievable how it's changed in a, in, in a generation. So but to go back to your question though, yes, um, it is a concern. Thanks for That's asking. Yeah. Thank yeah, well, there you have it, folks. That's straight <laughs> from the mouth of a local Peterborough County farmer who has um, crops and uh, livestock in the form of chicken barns. And I don't even know what all else said, uh, uh, probably still beef cows, maybe, David. But anyway, um, better to ask him than me. So, Anna Lady uh, agrees with that with simply by saying yes, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Deanna Lady, yeah. One <laughs> from Woodley Farm says, for sure, climate change is having an impact. We've experienced what I would consider a severe drought three of the past six years. Mitigating these risks is a primary goal and should be. Um, should be many more farmers to weather these events. Um, a book for, and should be on many farmers' minds <laughs> to weather these events. Thank you, Norm. Yeah, thanks, Norm. Uh, a book on changing underlying mindsets um, to approach sustainability um, by Isabel Romanowski. This is uh, called The Sustainability Mindset Principles, a guide to developing a mindset for a better world. Yeah, I think we're at the bottom now, and we're, yeah. Okay, that's all the, the, the written questions anyway. <laughs> um, quite a few. Is there other, I mean, at this point, if you've got other questions, if you always want to mute yourself and shout them out, that's a possibility here as well. We must focus on local food security. That focus will drive awareness and activity that will support all of the good practices and intentions that have been expressed tonight. So yeah, so it's good to have a few links um, put out as well. If anybody missed any of the links and wants to just uh, send us an email, we can um, put some of these titles and links into an email and send them back. So I think we'll wrap up now. Um, thank you so much everyone for coming and thank you so much, Pat, for your preparation and your clear explanation of a, a very complex and broad topic. You're very welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Great to have you, Pat. Thank you so much. Yeah, Pat, every time I thought I had a question, you had the answer before I could ask it. So it's, <laughs> it's amazing. It's oh my wow. question. Good answer too. <laughs> well, so maybe preparation does help. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, maybe. <laughs>